This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas As read by Gordon Mackenzie Chapter 3 The Catalans Beyond a bare, weather-worn wall, about a hundred paces from the spot where the two friends sat looking and listening as they drank their wine, was the village of the Catalans. Long ago this mysterious colony quitted Spain, and settled on the tongue of land on which it is to this day. Whence it came no one knew, and it spoke an unknown tongue. One of its chiefs, who understood Provençal, begged the commune of Marseille to give them this bare and barren promontory, where, like the sailors of old, they had run their boats ashore. The request was granted, and three months afterwards, around the twelve or fifteen small vessels which had brought these gypsies of the sea, a small village sprang up. This village, constructed in a singular and picturesque manner, half Moorish, half Spanish, still remains, and is inhabited by descendants of the first comers, who speak the language of their fathers. For three or four centuries they have remained upon this small promontory, on which they had settled like a flight of seabirds, without mixing with the Marseillaise population, intermarrying, and preserving their original customs, and the costume of their mother country, as they have preserved its language. Our readers will follow us along the only street of this little village, and enter with us one of the houses, which is sunburned to the beautiful dead-leaf color peculiar to the buildings of the country, and within coated with whitewash, like a Spanish posada, a young and beautiful girl, with hair as black as jet, her eyes as velvety as the gazelle's, was leaning with her back against the wainscot, rubbing in her slender, delicately molded fingers a bunch of heath blossoms, the flowers of which she was picking off and strewing on the floor. Her arms, bare to the elbow, brown, and modelled after those of the Arlesian Venus, moved with a kind of restless impatience, and she tapped the earth with her arched and supple foot, so as to display the pure and full shape of her well-turned leg in its red cotton, grey and blue clocked stocking. At three paces from her, seated in a chair which he balanced on two legs, leaning his elbow on an old worm-eaten table, was a tall young man of twenty, or two-and-twenty, who was looking at her with an air in which vexation and uneasiness were mingled. He questioned her with his eyes, but the firm and steady gaze of the young girl controlled his look. "'You see, Mercedes,' said the young man, "'here is Easter. Come round again. Tell me, is this the moment for a wedding?' "'I have answered you a hundred times, Fernand.' And really, you must be very stupid to ask me again. Well, repeat it. Repeat it, I beg of you, that I may at last believe it. Tell me for the hundredth time that you refuse my love, which had your mother's sanction. Make me understand once for all that you are trifling with my happiness, that my life or death are nothing to you. Ah, to have dreamed for ten years of being your husband, Mercedes, and to lose that hope, which was the only stay of my existence. At least it was not I who ever encouraged you in that hope, Fernand, replied Mercedes. You cannot reproach me with the slightest coquetry. I have always said to you, I love you as a brother. Do not ask for me more than sisterly affection, for my heart is another's. Is not this true, Fernand? 
Yes, that is very true, Mercedes, replied the young man. Yes, you have been cruelly frank with me. But do you forget that it is among the Catalans a sacred law to intermarry? You mistake, Fernand. It is not a law, but merely a custom. And I pray of you, do not cite this custom in your favor. You are included in the conscription, Fernand, and are only at liberty on sufferance, liable at any moment to be called upon to take up arms. Once a soldier, what would you do with me, a poor orphan, forlorn, without fortune, with nothing but a half-ruined hut and a few ragged nets? the miserable inheritance left by my father to my mother, and by my mother to me. She has been dead a year. And you know, Fernand, I have subsisted almost entirely on public charity. Sometimes you pretend I am useful to you, and that is an excuse to share with me the produce of your fishing, and I accept it, Fernand, because you are the son of my father's brother because we were brought up together, and still more because it would give you so much pain if I refuse. But I feel very deeply that this fish which I go and sell, and with the produce of which I buy the flax I spin, I feel very keenly, Fernand, that this is charity. And if it were, Mercedes, poor and lone as you are, you suit me as well as the daughter of the first ship-owner or the richest banker of Marseilles. What do such as we desire but a good wife and careful housekeeper? And where can I look for these better than in you? Fernand, answered Mercedes, shaking her head, a woman becomes a bad manager. And who shall say she will remain an honest woman when she loves another man better than her husband? Rest content with my friendship, for I say once more, that is all I can promise, and I will promise no more than I can bestow. I understand, replied Fernand. You can endure your own wretchedness patiently. But you are afraid to share mine. Well, Mercedes, beloved by you, I would tempt fortune. You would bring me good luck, and I should become rich. I could extend my occupation as a fisherman, might get a place as clerk in a warehouse, and become, in time, a dealer myself. You could do no such thing, Fernand. You are a soldier. And if you remain at the Catalans, it is because there is no war. So remain a fisherman, and contented with my friendship, as I cannot give you more. Well, I will do better, Mercedes. I will be a sailor. Instead of the costume of our fathers, which you despise, I will wear a varnished hat, a striped shirt, and a blue jacket with an anchor on the buttons. Would not that dress please you? "'What do you mean?' asked Mercedes, with an angry glance. "'What do you mean? I do not understand you.' "'I mean, Mercedes, that you are thus harsh and cruel with me "'because you are expecting someone who is thus attired. "'But perhaps he whom you await is inconstant. "'Or if he is not, the sea is so to him.' "'Fernand!' cried Mercedes. I believed you were good-hearted, and I was mistaken. Fernand, you are wicked to call to your aid jealousy and the anger of God. Yes, I will not deny it. I do await, and I do love him of whom you speak. And if he does not return, instead of accusing him of the inconstancy which you insinuate, I will tell you that he died loving me, and me only." The young girl made a gesture of rage. 
I understand you, Fernand. You would be revenged on him because I do not love you. You would cross your cattle and knife with his dirk. What end would that answer? To lose you my friendship if he were conquered, and see that friendship changed into hate if you were victor. Believe me, to seek a quarrel with a man is a bad method of pleasing the woman who loves that man. No, Fernand, you will not thus give away to evil thoughts. Unable to have me for your wife, you will content yourself with having me for your friend and sister. And besides, she added, her eyes troubled and moistened with tears. Wait, wait, Fernand. You said just now that the sea was treacherous, and he has been gone four months, and during these four months there have been some terrible storms. Fernand made no reply, nor did he attempt to check the tears which flowed down the cheeks of Mercedes, although for each of those tears he would have shed his heart's blood. But these tears flowed for another. He arose, paced a while up and down the hut, and then suddenly stopping before Mercedes, with his eyes glowing and his hands clinched. Say, Mercedes, he said, once for all, is this your final determination? I love Edmund Dantes, the young girl calmly replied, and none but Edmund shall ever be my husband. And you will always love him as long as I live. Fernand let fall his head like a defeated man, heaved a sigh that was like a groan, and then suddenly looked her full in the face with clinched teeth and expanded nostrils, said, But if he is dead, if he is dead, I shall die too. If he has forgotten you. Mercedes! called a joyous voice from without. Mercedes! Ah! exclaimed the young girl, blushing with delight, and fairly leaping in excess of love. You see, he has not forgotten me, for here he is! And rushing towards the door, she opened it, saying, Here, Edmund, here I am! Fernand, pale and trembling, drew back, like a traveller at the sight of a serpent, and fell into a chair beside him. Edmund and Mercedes were clasped in each other's arms. The burning Marseille sun, which shot into the room through the open door, covered them with a flood of light. At first they saw nothing around them. Their intense happiness isolated them from all the rest of the world, and they only spoke in broken words, which are the tokens of a joy so extreme that they seem rather the expression of sorrow. Suddenly Edmund saw the gloomy, pale, and threatening countenance of Fernand, as it was defined in the shadows. By a movement for which he could scarcely account to himself, the young Catalan placed his hand on the knife at his belt. "'Ah, your pardon,' said Dantes, frowning in his turn. "'I did not perceive that there were three of us.' Then, turning to Mercedes, he inquired, "'Who is this gentleman?' "'One who will be your best friend, Dantes, for he is my friend, my cousin, my brother. It is Fernand.' the man whom after you, Edmund, I love the best in the world. Do you not remember him? Yes, said Dantes, and without relinquishing Mercedes' hand, clasped in one of his own, he extended the other to the Catalan with a cordial air. But Fernand, instead of responding to this amiable gesture, remained mute and trembling. Edmund then cast his eyes 
scrutinizingly at the agitated and embarrassed Mercedes, and then again on the gloomy and menacing Fernand. This look told him all, and his anger waxed hot. I did not know when I came with such haste to you that I was to meet an enemy here. An enemy? cried Mercedes with an angry look at her cousin. An enemy in my house, do you say, Edmund? If I believed that, I would place my arm under yours and go with you to Marseilles, leaving the house to return to it no more. Fernand's eye darted lightning. And should any misfortune occur to you, dear Edmund, she continued with the same calmness which proved to Fernand that the young girl had read the very innermost depths of his sinister thought. If misfortune should occur to you, I would ascend the highest point of the Cape de Morgion and cast myself headlong from it. Fernand became deadly pale. But you are deceived, Edmund, she continued. You have no enemy here. There is no one but Fernand, my brother, who will grasp your hand as a devoted friend. And at these words the young girl fixed her imperious look on the Catalan, who, as if fascinated by it, came slowly towards Edmund and offered him his hand. His hatred, like a powerless though furious wave, was broken against the strong ascendancy which Mercedes exercised over him. Scarcely, however, had he touched Edmund's hand than he felt he had done all he could do, and he rushed hastily out of the house. Oh! he exclaimed, running furiously and tearing at his hair. Oh, who will deliver me from this man? Wretched, wretched that I am! Hello, Catalan! Hello, Fernand! Where are you running to? exclaimed a voice. The young man stopped suddenly, looked around him, and perceived Caderousse sitting at table with Danglars under an arbor. Well, said Caderousse, why don't you come? Are you really in such a hurry that you have no time to pass the time of day with your friends? Particularly when they have still a full bottle before them, added Danglars. Fernand looked at them both with a stupefied air, but did not say a word. "'He seems besotted,' said Danglars, pushing Caderousse with his knee. "'Are we mistaken, and is Dante's triumphant in spite of all we have believed?' "'Why, we must inquire into that,' was Caderousse's reply. And turning towards the young man, said, "'Well, Catalan, can't you make up your mind?' Fernand wiped away the perspiration steaming from his brow, and slowly entered the arbor, whose shade seemed to restore somewhat of calmness to his senses, and whose coolness somewhat of refreshment to his exhausted body. "'Good day,' said he. "'You called me, didn't you?' And he fell, rather than sat down, on one of the seats which surrounded the table. I called you because you were running like a madman, and I was afraid you would throw yourself into the sea, said Caderousse, laughing. Why, when a man has friends, they are not only to offer him a glass of wine, but, moreover, to prevent his swallowing three or four pints of water unnecessarily. Fernand gave a groan, which resembled a sob, and dropped his head into his hands, his elbows leaning on the table. "'Well, Fernand, I must say,' said Caderousse, beginning the conversation with that brutality of the common people in which curiosity destroys all diplomacy. "'You look uncommonly like a rejected lover.' And he burst into a hoarse laugh. "Bah," said Danglars. "'A lad of his make was not born to be unhappy in love. "'You are laughing at him, Caderousse.' "'No,' he replied. Only hark how he sighs. Come, come, Fernand, said Caderousse. Hold up your head and answer us. It's not polite not to reply to your friends who ask news of your health. 
"'My health is well enough,' said Fernand, clenching his hands without raising his head. "'Ah, you see, Danglars,' said Caderousse, winking at his friend. "'This is how it is. Fernand, whom you see here, is a good and brave Catalan, one of the best fishermen in Marseilles, and he is in love with a very fine girl named Mercedes.' But it appears, unfortunately, that the girl is in love with the mate of the Ferron. And as the Ferron arrived today, why, you understand. No, I don't understand, said Danglars. Poor Fernand has been dismissed, continued Caderousse. Well, and what then? said Fernand, lifting up his head and looking at Caderousse like a man who looks for someone on whom to vent his anger. Mercedes is not accountable to any person, is she? Is she not free to love whomever she will? Oh, if you take it in that sense, said Caderousse, it is another thing. But I thought you were a Catalan, and they told me the Catalans were not men to allow themselves to be supplanted by a rival. It was even told me that Fernand, especially, was terrible in his vengeance. Fernand smiled piteously. A lover is never terrible, he said. Poor fellow, remarked Danglars, affecting to pity the young man from the bottom of his heart. Why, you see, he did not expect to see Dante's return so suddenly. He thought he was dead, perhaps, or perchance faithless. These things always come on us more severely when they come suddenly. Ah, ma foi, under any circumstances, said Caderousse, who drank as he spoke, and on whom the fumes of the wine began to take effect. Under any circumstances, Fernand is not the only person put out by the fortunate arrival of Dante's, is he, Danglars? No, you're right. And I should say that would bring him ill luck. Well, never mind, answered Caderousse, pouring out a glass of wine for Fernand and filling his own for the eighth or ninth time, while Danglars had merely sipped his. Never mind. In the meantime, he marries Mercedes, the lovely Mercedes. At least he returns to do that. During this time, Danglars fixed his piercing glance on the young man, on whose heart Caderousse's words fell like molten lead. And when is the wedding to be? he asked. Oh, it is not yet fixed, murmured Fernand. No, but it will be said Caderousse, as surely as Dante's will be captain of the Ferron, eh, Danglars? Danglars shuddered at this unexpected attack and turned to Caderousse, whose countenance he scrutinized to try and detect whether the blow was premeditated, but he read nothing but envy in a countenance already rendered brutal and stupid by drunkenness. Well, said he, filling up the glasses, let us drink to Captain Edmund Dantes, husband of the beautiful Cataline. Caderousse raised his glass to his mouth with unsteady hand and swallowed the contents at a gulp. Fernand dashed his own on the ground. Eh, eh, stammered Caderousse. What do I see down there by the wall in the direction of the Catalans? Look, Fernand, your eyes are better than mine. I believe I see double. You know, wine is a deceiver, but I should say it was two lovers walking side by side and hand in hand. Heaven forgive me, they do not know what we can see them, and they are actually embracing. Danglars did not lose one pang that Fernand endured. Do you know them, Fernand? he said. Yes was the reply in a low voice. It is Edmund and Mercedes. Ah, see there now, said Caderousse, and I did not recognize them. 
Hello, Dantes. Hello, lovely damsel. Come this way and let us know when the wedding is to be, for Fernand here is so obstinate he will not tell us. Hold your tongue, will you? said Danglars, pretending to restrain Caderousse, who, with the tenacity of drunkards, leaned out of the arbor. Try to stand upright and let the lovers make love without interruption. Look at Fernand and follow his example. He is well behaved. Fernand, probably excited beyond bearing, pricked by Danglars, as the bull is by the bandilleros, was about to rush out, for he had risen from his seat and seemed to be collecting himself to dash headlong upon his rival, when Mercedes, smiling and graceful, lifted up her lovely head and looked at them with her clear and bright eyes. At this Fernand recollected her threat of dying if Edmund died, and dropped again heavily on his seat. Danglars looked at the two men, one after the other, the one brutalized by liquor, the other overwhelmed with love. "'I shall get nothing from these fools,' he muttered. "'And I am very much afraid of being here between a drunkard and a coward. "'He's an envious fellow making himself boozy on wine when he ought to be nursing his wrath, "'and here is a fool who sees the woman he loves stolen from under his nose and takes on like a big baby. "'Yet this Catalan has eyes that glisten like those of the vengeful Spaniards, Sicilians, and Calabrians, and the other has fists big enough to crush an ox at one blow. Unquestionably Edmund Starr is in the ascendant, and he will marry the splendid girl, and he will be captain too, and laugh at us all, unless— A sinister smile passed over Danglar's lips. "'Unless I take a hand in the affair,' he added. "'Hello!' continued Caderousse, half rising with his fist on the table. "'Hello, Edmund! Do you not see your friends, or are you too proud to speak to them?' "'No, my dear fellow,' replied Dantes. "'I am not proud, but I am happy, and happiness blinds, I think, more than pride.' "'Ah, very well, that's an explanation,' said Caderousse. "'How do you do, Madame Dantes?' Mercedes curtsied gravely and said, "'That is not my name, and in my country it bodes ill fortune, they say, "'to call a young girl by the name of her betrothed before he becomes her husband. "'So call me Mercedes, if you please.' "'We must excuse our worthy neighbor Caderousse.' said Dantes. He is so easily mistaken. So, then, the wedding is to take place immediately, Monsieur Dantes, said Danglars, bowing to the young couple. As soon as possible, Monsieur Danglars. Today all preliminaries will be arranged at my father's, and tomorrow, or next day at latest, the wedding festival here at La Reserve. My friends will be there, I hope. That is to say, you are invited, Monsieur Danglars, and you, Caderousse. <laughs> and Fernand, said Caderousse with a chuckle, Fernand, too, is invited. My wife's brother is my brother, said Edmund. And we, Mercedes and I, should be very sorry if he were absent at such a time. Fernand opened his mouth to reply, but his voice died on his lips, and he could not utter a word. Today the preliminaries, tomorrow or next day the ceremony, you are in a hurry, Captain. Danglars, said Edmund, smiling, I will say to you, as Mercedes said just now to Caderousse, do not give me a title which does not belong to me. That may bring me bad luck. Your pardon, replied Danglars. I merely said you seemed in a hurry. We have lots of time. The Ferron cannot be under way again in less than three months. We are always in a hurry to be happy, Monsieur Danglars, for when we have suffered a long time, we have great difficulty in believing in good fortune. But it is not selfishness alone that makes me thus in haste. I must go to Paris. Ah, really? 
to Paris. And will it be the first time you have ever been there, Dantes? Yes. Have you business there? Not of my own. The last commission of poor Captain Leclerc. You know to what I allude, Danglars. It is sacred. Besides, I shall only take the time to go and return. Yes, yes, I understand, said Danglars, and then in a low tone he added, To Paris, no doubt to deliver the letter which the Grand Marshal gave him. Ah, this letter gives me an idea. Ah, Dantes, my friend, you are not yet registered number one on board the good ship Ferrand. Then turning towards Edmund, who was walking away, A pleasant journey, he cried. Thank you, said Edmund with a friendly nod, and the two lovers continued on their way, as calm and joyous as if they were the very elect of heaven. End of chapter 3 As read by Gordon Mackenzie Troy, Michigan October 2006This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas, as read by Gordon Mackenzie. Chapter 4 Conspiracy Danglars followed Edmund and Mercedes with his eyes until the two lovers disappeared behind one of the angles of Fort St. Nicholas. Then, turning round, he perceived Fernand, who had fallen pale and trembling into his chair, while Caderousse stammered out the words of a drinking song. "'Well, my dear sir,' said Danglars to Fernand, "'here is a marriage which does not appear to make everybody happy.' "'It drives me to despair,' said Fernand." Do you, then, love Mercedes? I adore her. For long, as long as I have known her, always. And you sit there, tearing your hair instead of seeking to remedy your condition. I did not think that was the way of your people. What would you have me do? said Fernand. How do I know? Is it my affair? I am not in love with Mademoiselle Mercedes. But for you, in the words of the gospel, seek and you shall find. I have found already. What? I would stab the man, but the woman told me that if any misfortune happened to her betrothed she would kill herself. Pooh! Women say those things, but never do them. You do not know Mercedes. What she threatens, she will do. Idiot, muttered Danglars. Whether she kill herself or not, what matter, provided Dantes is not captain? Before Mercedes should die, replied Fernand, with the accents of unshaken resolution, I would die myself. "'That's what I call love,' said Caderousse, with a voice more tipsy than ever. "'That's love, or I don't know what love is.' "'Come,' said Danglars. "'You appear to me a good sort of fellow, and hang me, I should like to help you, but—' "'Yes,' said Caderousse. "'But how?' "'My dear fellow,' replied Danglars, you are three parts drunk. Finish the bottle, and you will be completely so. Drink, then, and do not meddle with what we are discussing, for that requires all one's wit and cool judgment. I? Drunk? said Caderousse. Well, that's a good one. 
I could drink four more such bottles. They are no bigger than cologne flasks. Pere Pomphile, more wine! And Caderousse rattled his glass upon the table. You were saying, sir, said Fernand, awaiting with great anxiety the end of this interrupted remark. Uh, what was I saying? I forget. This drunken Caderousse has made me lose the thread of my sentence. Drunk if you like. So much the worse for those who fear wine, for it is because they have bad thoughts which they are afraid the liquor will extract from their hearts. And Caderousse began to sing the two last lines of a song very popular at the time. Tous les méchants sont buveux d'eau. C'est bien prouve par le déluge. The wicked are great drinkers of water, as the flood proved once for all. You said, sir, you would like to help me, but... Yes, but I added, to help you it would be sufficient that Dantes did not marry her you love, and the marriage may easily be thwarted, methinks, and yet Dantes need not die. Death alone can separate them, remarked Fernand. You talk like a noodle, my friend, said Caderousse. And here is Danglars, who is a wide-awake, clever, deep fellow, who will prove to you that you are wrong. Prove it, Danglars. I have answered for you. Say there is no need why Dante should die. It would indeed be a pity he should. Dante's is a good fellow. I like Dante's. Dante's, your health. Fernand rose impatiently. Let him run on said Danglars, restraining the young man. Drunk as he is, he is not much out in what he says. Absence severs as well as death, and if the walls of a prison were between Edmund and Mercedes, they would be as effectually separated as if he lay under a tombstone. Yes, but one gets out of prison, said Caderousse, who, with what sense was left him, listened eagerly to the conversation. And when one gets out and one's name is Edmond Dantes, one seeks revenge. What matters that? muttered Fernand. And why, I should like to know, persisted Caderousse. Should they put Dantes in prison? He has not robbed or killed or murdered. Hold your tongue, said Danglars. I won't hold my tongue, replied Caderousse. I say I want to know why they should put Dantes in prison. I like Dantes. Dantes, your health. And he swallowed another glass of wine. Danglars saw in the muddled look of the tailor the progress of his intoxication, and turning towards Fernand said, Well, you understand there is no need to kill him. Certainly not. If, as you said just now, you have the means of having Dante's arrested, have you that means? It is to be found for the searching. But why should I meddle in the matter? It is no affair of mine. I know not why you meddle, said Fernand, seizing his arm. But this I know. You have some motive of personal hatred against Dante's. For he who himself hates is never mistaken in the sentiment of others. I! Motives of hatred against Dante's? None on my word. I saw you were unhappy, and your unhappiness interested me, that's all. But since you believe I act for my own account, adieu, my dear friend. Get out of the affair as best you may and Danglars rose as if he meant to depart. "'No, no,' said Fernand, restraining him. "'Stay. It is of very little consequence to me at the end of the matter whether you have any angry feeling or not against Dantes. I hate him. I confess it openly. Do you find the means I will execute it, provided it is not to kill the man, for Mercedes has declared she will kill herself if Dantes is killed.' Caderousse, 
who had let his head drop to the table, now raised it, and looking at Fernand with his dull and fishy eyes, he said, "'Kill Dantes! Who talks of killing Dantes? I won't have him killed! I, I won't! He's my friend, and this morning offered to share his money with me as I shared mine with him. I won't have Dantes killed! I won't! And who said a word about killing him, muddlehead? replied Danglars. We were merely joking. Drink to his health, he added, filling Caderousse's glass, and do not interfere with us. Yes, yes, Dante's good health, said Caderousse, emptying his glass. Here's to his health, his health. Hurrah! But the means, the means, said Fernand. "'Have you not hit upon any?' asked Danglars. "'No, you undertook to do so.' "'True,' replied Danglars. "'The French have the superiority over the Spaniards, "'that the Spaniards ruminate, while the French invent.' "'Do you invent, then?' said Fernand impatiently. "'Waiter,' said Danglars, Pen, ink, and paper. Pen, ink, and paper, muttered Fernand. Yes, I am a supercargo. Pen, ink, and paper are my tools, and without my tools, I am fit for nothing. Pen, ink, and paper, then, called Fernand loudly. There's what you want on that table, said the waiter. Bring them here. The waiter did as he was desired. "'When one thinks,' said Caderousse, letting his hand drop on the paper, "'there is here wherewithal to kill a man more sure "'than if we waited at the corner of a wood to assassinate him. "'I have always had more dread of a pen, "'a bottle of ink, and a sheet of paper,' than of a sword or a pistol. "'The fellow is not so drunk as he appears to be,' said Danglars. "'Give him some more wine, Fernand.' Fernand filled Caderousse's glass, who, like the confirmed topper he was, lifted his hand from the paper and seized the glass. The Catalan watched him until Caderousse, almost overcome by this fresh assault on his senses, rested or rather dropped, his glass upon the table. "'Well,' resumed the Catalan, as he saw the final glimmer of Caderousse's reason vanishing before the last glass of wine. "'Well, then, I should say, for instance,' resumed Danglars, "'that if, after a voyage such as Dante's has just made, in which he touched at the island of Elba, Someone were to denounce him to the king's procurer as a Bonapartist agent. I will denounce him, exclaimed the young man hastily. Yes, but they will make you then sign your declaration and confront you with him you have denounced. I will supply you with the means of supporting your accusation. For I know the fact well. But Dantes cannot remain forever in prison, and one day or other he will leave it. And the day when he comes out, woe betide him who was the cause of his incarceration. Oh, I should like nothing better than he would come and seek a quarrel with me. Yes? And Mercedes, Mercedes, who will detest you if you have only the misfortune to scratch the skin of her dearly beloved Edmund? True, said Fernand. No, no, continued Danglars. If we resolve on such a step, it would be much better to take, as I now do, this pen, dip it into this ink, and write with the left hand, that the writing may not be recognized, 
the denunciation we propose. And Danglars, uniting practice with theory, wrote with his left hand, and in a writing reversed from his usual style, and totally unlike it, the following lines which he handed to Fernand, and which Fernand read in an undertone. The Honourable, the King's Attorney, is informed by a friend of the throne and religion that one Edmund Dantes, mate of the ship Ferron, arrived this morning from Smyrna, after having touched at Naples and Porto Ferraro, has been entrusted by Murat with a letter for the usurper, and by the usurper with a letter for the Bonapartist Committee in Paris. Proof of this crime will be found on arresting him, for the letter will be found upon him, or at his father's, or in his cabin on board the Ferron. Very good, resumed Danglars. Now your revenge looks like common sense, for in no way can it revert to yourself, and the matter will thus work its own way. There is nothing to do now, but fold the letter as I am doing, and write upon it, To the King's Attorney. And that's all settled. And Danglars wrote the address as he spoke. "'Yes, that's all settled!' exclaimed Caderousse, who, by a last effort of intellect, had followed the reading of the letter and instinctively comprehended all the misery which such a denunciation must entail. "'Yes, and that's all settled. Only it will be an infamous shame!' And he stretched out his hand to reach the letter. "'Yes,' said Danglars, taking it from beyond his reach. And as what I say and do is merely in jest, and I, amongst the first and foremost, should be sorry if anything happened to Dantes, the worthy Dantes. Look here, and taking the letter he squeezed it up in his hands and threw it into a corner of the arbor. All right, said Caderousse. Dantes is my friend, and I won't have him ill-used. And who thinks of using him ill? Certainly neither I nor Fernand, said Danglars, rising and looking at the young man who still remained seated, but whose eye was fixed on the denunciatory sheet of paper flung into the corner. In this case, replied Caderousse, Let's have some more wine. I wish to drink to the health of Edmund and the lovely Mercedes. You have had too much already, drunkard, said Danglars. And if you continue, you will be compelled to sleep here, because unable to stand on your own legs. I? said Caderousse, rising with all the offended dignity of a drunken man. I can't keep my own legs. Why, I'll wager I can go up into the belfry of the Akuls, and without staggering, too. Done, said Danglars. I'll take your bet, but tomorrow. Today it is time to return. Give me your arm and let us go. Very well, let us go, said Caderousse. I don't want your arm at all. Come, Fernand, won't you return to Marseilles with us? No, said Fernand. I shall return to the Catalans. You are wrong. Come with us to Marseilles. Come along. I will not. What do you mean you will not? Well, just as you like, my prince. There's liberty for all the world. Come along, Danglars, and let the young gentleman return to the Catalans if he chooses. Danglars took advantage of Caderousse's temper at the moment to take him off toward Marseilles by the Porte Saint-Victor, staggering as he went. When they had advanced about twenty yards, Danglars looked back and saw Fernand stoop, pick up the crumpled paper, and putting it into his pocket, then rush out of the arbor towards Pilon. Well, said Caderousse, why, uh, what a lie he told. He said he was going to the Catalans, and he's going to the city. Hello, Fernand! 
No, you don't see straight, said Danglars. He's gone right enough. Well, said Caderousse, I should have said not. How treacherous wine is. Come, come, said Danglars to himself. Now the thing is at work, and it will affect its purpose unassisted. End of chapter 4 As read by Gordon Mackenzie Troy, Michigan, October 2006